Is this what you call a leap of faith, <laughs> right? From intellectualism <laughs> to consciousness it is one big leap. Doesn't take any faith; it just needs a leg <laughs> <laughs> or a broken leg. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> when we say a temple, this must be understood: the temple is like a body. To energize the system, temple is not a place of worship. Temple is not a place where you go and make appeals to some unknown god up there, this is not that kind. This is not a place where you lead a prayer, that is the uniqueness of this culture. Here a temple is like a body, energized in a certain way. Now if you see the masculine temple that we have, is circular, circular in nature because that is the quality that it is. The feminine temple is in the form of a triangle. There's a whole lot of things in its geometry, how it is made. See all the wings are thirty-three feet, properly done in the uh, multiples of eleven, it is made in a certain way to create a feminine energy there. Why thirty-three? If you go into these details, there are enormous amount of science behind that. Like your spinal column is thirty-three aspects and… Which uh, I just risked right now <laughs> <laughs> So there are so many aspects to this which I don't wish to go right now, but essentially it is feminine energy. Where was the need for this in a way? See, one thing is today, the feminine is at huge risk on the planet. Mm -hmm. So immediately people may think, uh, oh, that's because of the man. Maybe man instigated it, but when I say masculine and feminine, I'm not talking about male-female. I'm talking about those two aspects, those two dimensions of life, without which our life will not be beautiful. Our life cannot work actually, even in the most fundamental way. So because people start thinking in terms of dominance, this is a problem. If you're not looking at life as dominance, if you're looking at life as integration, if you're looking at life as cooperation, if you're looking at life as oneness, then without these two dimensions, there is no existence. But unfortunately, societies have taken on to this as to who is dominating right now, whether masculine or feminine. If any one of them dominates, it'll turn ugly. It's not that if masculine dominates, it'll turn ugly, or feminine dominates, it'll turn ugly. If any one of them dominates, it'll turn ugly. Above all, if you start thinking in terms of dominance, your life will turn ugly. By domination, you will not know life. Only by inclusion, you will know life. So this is essentially to create an energy force where people can experience a powerful sense of feminine, a fiery nature of the feminine thing. See, feminine is a very fiery form of energy. But today, because we have made economics the most important aspect of uh, human societies, naturally, see we need to understand this, economics is being glorified as if it's some kind of a divine thing. Mm -hmm. Economics essentially means survival, survival process. Economics has a place in our life for sure, but it is not the be-all of life. So feminine doesn't belong to that dimension. If in these societies, love, art, music, above all aesthetics of life was dominant in a society. If aesthetics was as important as economics, nobody had to bring up the feminine. Feminine would be naturally, exuberantly alive and manifest in the society. Today, either we have… we are slowly making all the women like men because they have to survive, they have to earn money, they have to provide, or a small percentage of them in reaction, not being able to cope with that, they're becoming like Barbie dolls. Here we are creating a woman who is fiery and powerful in a completely different way. But what you're saying is, you just said love, art, aesthetics. You use those three words as part of the feminine energy. Now, I'm a filmmaker, I'd like to assume that I have all three in myself. So that's my feminine energy. Yes, it yes. is. So if you else? do not have the feminine, you won't look and think in terms of what's beautiful, what's not beautiful, you'll only think in terms of what's useful and what's not useful. You'll become utilitarian, the masculine is like that. So that's… Uh, so so I... you being a man or a woman has nothing to do with it. So am I in conflict constantly between my masculine and feminine self? Why? See, that's the whole thing. These two energies are the basis of creation. Why would they be in conflict? They're in absolute collaboration. Yeah. It is only in human mind that it's in conflict. In life, it's not in conflict. In energy, it's not in conflict. 
Only in mind it's in conflict because mind divides. Because to people when listening to you say the sheer absolute power of the feminine energy, they don't relate to that. They, they see feminine energy as something gentle, nurturing, no, soft. No, no. Tell me about the power of feminine energy because see, a lot of our culture talks about various goddesses that have a sense of huge <laughs> power see, and almost violent power. The original power. goddesses that we created in this culture were all Kali, Bhairavi, now she's Bhairavi, all fierce, powerful creatures, okay? Somewhere down the line, when the outside influences came upon the culture and people made fun of them, people ridiculed your women are like this <laughs> mm. Then they tried to domesticate the feminine and then they created Saraswati, Lakshmi, very soft, gentle, housewife kind of feminine. Bhairavi, you, you can't, can't contain her to the limitations of your not that she's… she cannot stay in your house, you cannot contain her to the boundaries of your house. She's… she's all-encompassing, that's the nature of her, that's the nature of the feminine, that it's all-embracing, not all-conquering, you must understand. Man wants to be in conquest, a woman wants to embrace. And By conquest, you'll never have it, by embrace, you'll have it, isn't it? See now, now it's come to a point where the work has become almost feminine, okay? You have… you need gentle hands to do what they're doing. But before that, this rock was in the quarry, okay? There you needed some hard tools to cut it, make it a big piece, transport it in the truck, bring it in, hold it there, cut it down to size. All that was very masculine. If that masculine work had not happened, this feminine part would be not possible. This is so in the society also, I want you to see. If the man goes about, breaks down nature, builds his home and all this, then the woman comes in and makes it beautiful. If she didn't come in, he would just have a rock house which is of no consequence. Nobody enjoys being there, they'll have a house and they'll live outdoor <laughs> so It's happening in cultures where feminine has been suppressed. They have great homes, but they always want to be outdoors <laughs> It's a good place to talk about what consecration means. What does consecration mean? <laughs> what do you consecrate? I mean, what is that? What is that process and what is it achieved? See, this is happening everywhere around you, all the time. One form of existence or one form of energy is transforming itself into another. What is mud is becoming flower, fruit and food, isn't it? Yeah. What is filth is actually becoming a flower. Yeah. What is stink is becoming fragrance. It's happening. If you eat the food, this food becomes from what was just a grain of rice becomes such a sophisticated machinery like human body. So, if you make mud into food, you call it agriculture. Yeah. If you make food into this, you call it digestion. If you make this into mud, usually we call it cremation <laughs> or <Yeah>. burial <laughs> or whatever <laughs> So, if you can make a stone or some other gross substance, a material substance, into a divine reverberance, into highest, subtlest possible reverberance, that's called consecration. So the whole existence is doing it all the time in different levels. So this is a certain science and a technology through which you transform the grosser elements into finer elements. Unfortunately, this was always mistaken as producing gold. The alchemy of the West is always talking about producing gold. Gold has no worth except in the market, okay? It's only greed which makes a man go towards gold. The Indian alchemy never talked about making gold. Indian alchemy always talked about making grosser elements into finer substances, making a stone into the divine. So the whole Indian alchemy is like a consecration process. So right now, there is an agricultural science, right? Yeah. They will teach you how to study the soil, the qualities of the soil, the seed, the manure, everything. So they only set those conditions. They will set the soil conditions, they'll set the seed condition, everything else that's necessary to grow. But the growth itself, the transforming earth into food, that no scientist does. That is happening by nature. Here also the same thing. We have a whole science, if we set all these conditions, the growth becomes subtle. So when I was building something and uh, this was my first project, I'm building a farm in near Mysore. And I'm doing it with a real short shoestring. So, 
when I want to end… in the end I want to paint it. And I don't have the thing to get painters to paint this large wall surface. So I want to paint it and it takes too much time to go like this. So what I do, I dip, hold it here and just walk. Well, one smear of paint from this end to that end, that end to this end. The first smear that I did, I dipped and walked like this. Here the smear was thick. As it went, it became lighter, 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 lighter and became really subtle. I just looked at this and I burst into tears. That was one great moment of realization for me. This is the whole creation. From a rock to divine, this all the thing is. It's either dense or it's subtle, that's all it is. It's the same existence everywhere. Whether you look at the earth or you look at your body or you look at what you call as divine, it is all the same substance. It is just getting subtle. And whatever we are creating as divine is just that, making a rock into a subtler form of energy. Every substance on the planet is exuding a certain kind of energy, reverberation, which is a scientific fact. You can change the way it exudes, what type of energy it exudes, you can change that. Altering that to a very subtle and useful form of energy is consecration process. So temples were energy forms, temples were energy places, where every day in the morning before you start your day, you go sit there for some time, imbibe this energy and go into the world. Why this became necessary is, see once you step into the world for an ordinary person, a common man, every transaction in the world, whatever it may be, what is your profit is somebody's loss, what is somebody's profit is your loss. Whether it's family transaction between husband and wife, father and son, between business partners or every transaction, there's something to give up, something to take everywhere, that's why it's a transaction. So if you're not sufficiently lubricated in your… the way you are, every transaction is a point of friction, a possible friction. There are some people who are making every transaction into a friction, some people are conducting their transactions gracefully. So every day going, sitting in the temple was just this, you are well lubricated. When you step out, you can pass through the world with least amount of friction. So this is a very, very significant instruction which is still alive in the southern part of this country. Here nobody tells you if you go to the temple, you should pray. They always tell you if you go there, you must sit there. You must sit there for some time and come. But today the instruction has become like this, the way they're following it is they touch their bottom to the floor and they go. Nobody told you you have to pray, nobody told you you have to make an offering, you just have to sit there. But they also told that people on the spiritual path need not go to the temple because they have self-charging mechanisms. So temple is essentially for a householder who has no his own way of transforming his energies. Use a public place, a battery charging place it is. So this is feminine energy, it's triangular. The whole temple is triangular, it's an equilateral triangle, okay? There are many uh, aspects of the geometry which I don't want to go in, but the significant aspect is there's another triangle fitting into this in a smaller capacity. Mm -hmm. So a downward triangle is… That's this one. No, this downward triangle yeah. always symbolizes the feminine. Okay. The upward moving triangle symbolizes the masculine. But here, normally it would be depicted like this. Okay, this is also the star of David and whatever else the star is used and this is the basic yantra for Sri Chakra and everything. This is the masculine and feminine meeting. But here, the masculine is held inside the feminine triangle because here the masculine is unborn. It's in the womb of the feminine. So it's a smaller triangle held inside. It is not a larger triangle like a male meeting the female. This is like in the womb. The masculine is a child in the feminine's womb because here the feminine is in a dominant form. So though there is a whole geometry of things into… in this where we are trying to build a body of the feminine mm -hmm. to energize it in a certain way. So Devi will sit here, this is also a, f a triangle and this is into the earth, here there are steps going in. Mm -hmm. Being in the earth is very important for the feminine. So the deity herself is going into the earth and people have to go in to meet her, that's how it is. And uh, there are lots of symbolisms attached and geometry involved in this whole process. In the end, today you have walked in, it's like a construction site. After two months, you walk into this space. Forget about the ambience, walk with your eyes closed. You will see, it'll just hit you in your face, the whole energy of it. That's how it will be.